Um, I will start by introducing myself. My name is Asher Goodman, and I'm a facilitator of learning with the Sierra Club BC. Um, so I focus primarily on our new Climate in Place program, which is for grades six to eight. Um, I also run some programming for younger students, but the focus of today is our Climate in Place program, so we'll stick there. Um, my ancestry is Jewish, and I'm from um, Eastern Europe and North Africa. Um, I grew up in Oregon on the lands of the Kalapuya Nation and moved to the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Waututh lands in 2015. My educational background is in ecology, and I love thinking about trees and ecosystems and um, how everything is connected. And I've been working in outdoor education uh, really since I was 18. Um, and I won't tell you how old I am because it's a secret so that I seem more professional. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, that's where my passion lies. Um, with me today, I have Kirsten Schar and Alyssa. Um, so I'll introduce Alyssa first. Um, and she's going to be leading the second half of our workshop on her Roots and Seeds program. Um, so Alyssa is a Brazilian Canadian writer, literary arts educator and education program designer dedicated to using the tools of creative writing as a catalyst for social change and climate action. From K to 12 students to senior citizens, she equips groups of all ages to develop personal voice, write with confidence, engage with literature and share their stories, opinions and ideas for public audiences on stage, on the page, and in public space. Amazing, can't wait to hear everything from her later. Um, with me also, I have Kirsten. And Kirsten, if you wanna introduce yourself. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Kirsten, and I've been a facilitator of learning with the Sierra Club for the past seven school years. I originally am um, from Haudenosaunee territory, which is in the province of Ontario, and moved to Victoria, so almost seven years ago um, to start this position with the Sierra Club. And I teach primarily um, in this year, the K to grade five programs. And I spend, um, fortu I'm fortunate enough to spend a lot of time outside um, with the students and enjoying place-based education. I'm a certified teacher here in British Columbia. And I just love um, having this opportunity to share my knowledge and my passion for this beautiful place um, and embrace this opportunity for um, place-based education with our students and with our co-learners um, such as yourself. And so I'm gonna pass this now over to Shar to introduce herself. And thank you so much for joining us today. I was so busy listening um, each while. Uh, greetings, everyone. I'm coming to you from my home in Sook. Um, I'm not too far from Metulia, which is Victoria, for those of you who might not have known. Um, and um, I'm here today just to help to be in the background and facilitate the conversation um, if needed. Um, I have a number of hats. One of my hats I'm wearing today would be a cultural voice, but also um, I also have a lens of education as well to bring to the conversation if needed. So um, I hope you all will um, listen deeply. There is some really cool things for you to hear um, and maybe participate in coming up. So many haichika ahead of time for all of your uh, good ears. I'll leave it back to Asher. There you go, hon. Great. Um, thank you, Sharon Kirsten. Okay, let's get going. Um, so here's a little outline of our time together. It's not very long, unfortunately, um, but we are going to focus on our new youth programming, the Climate in Place programming, um, which I've been primarily running for us. Then Alyssa will introduce the Roots and Seeds program that she ran last summer and share some resources on how you can access it. Very exciting. Um, then we'll have a little bit of time to connect, Q&A depending on our timing, and that will be it. Um, so the first thing we wanted to start with was a little background and foundation in um, our transformational process as an organization, because this has really grounded our work as the education team here at Sierra Club BC. 
Um, so as we've looked back and reflected on ourselves as an organization, um, we've had to take accountability for some, some things that we wanna change going forward. So in the past, our organization has not always done an amazing job at including indigenous voices and uplifting indigenous jurisdiction. And so we're really looking forward into how we can take, um, take account for our past and try to move in a better direction together. Um, so we've developed a strategic plan as well as a plan called Balancing the Canoe, which is kind of our way of thinking about how we can move together in a good way in a better way. Um, so this was created with Shar and with some of our other lovely members of our organization, and is really about how we want to be going forward. So as an education team, we're really taking this seriously, and we want our education to be through a decolonial lens and looking at how we can uplift the voices of those whose voices haven't really been uplifted by mainstream society and by environmental movements that have happened here in North America historically. Um, so one way that we're doing this is through this beautiful conversation with Manatha. So this is something that I recommend everyone watch. Um, it is really a grounding philosophy for us and how we want to engage with the natural world, the non-human world, um, with all of our relatives um, and with ourselves and our co-learners. So along with this conversation with Manatha, Shar and I also have developed some curriculum that you can access and I would really encourage you to read through that. Um, and potentially watch this video with your co-learners, with your students, um, go through the resources we've provided there. All of this is going to be dropped in the chat. Um, so I really, really recommend that you access these resources because it's something that we have put a lot of love and care into and think are really, really important. Great. Um, so now to kind of some of our newer programming along with the curriculum and the conversation with Manathat are these workshops that we're running for our middle school ages, so grades six to eight. So these are free workshops. Um, they, we run them all across BC. If you're located in the lower mainland, so on Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil tooth lands where I am, um, we can do them in person. If you're located anywhere else in BC, then they are virtual. Um, if you do the in-person ones, they're 100% outside, very exciting. Um, virtually, of course, they are not 100% outside, but we really encourage you to take your students outside no matter what. Um, so these workshops are aligned with the BC curriculum and they're designed to inspire locally based action and stewardship. So these have been rooted in environmental and social justice and we focus on reconciliation. Um, so there are different themes for these programs depending on where yourself and your co-learners are at. And we created these themes so that um, the workshops would be relevant for a variety of learners and a variety of different brains and interests. So the first one is for co-learners who maybe don't feel as comfortable with the basic science of climate change. So it's thinking a little bit more about how climate change is happening, the, the kind of logistics of it, how it works, um, and is deeply aligned with the grade seven curriculum specifically, which really focuses on the science of climate change. Um, our second program option is ecology and ecosystems. And here we focus both on traditional ecology that maybe is coming out of the university system, as well as traditional ecological knowledge tech. And we combine these because they are both important sources of ecology in ways that we can understand our natural environment. Um, our third one is focused on youth activism. So this is a really good one if you have co-learners or students who already kind of know about climate change and are ready to to get out in the streets and take action and make change. So this is focused on both giving them examples of other students who are doing the same thing um, and help facilitate their, um, their empowerment and their voice. Um, we also have a self-expression through art program. Um, so this is for students who maybe are struggling. Climate change is a really heavy topic. And so we think it's really important to also take care of students and co-learners emotional needs when it comes to climate change. Um, it's something that we're thinking about a lot when we're walking into schools that we don't just want to hand the youth this weight of climate change and then walk out like that's totally fine. So the self-expression is really to help students process and to share their voices. And then the final one that we're offering is the food systems and sovereignty because we recognize that um, our food system is deeply connected to climate change and um, has deep both cultural and ecological um, aspects that we want to take seriously. 
Um, so these are our different program options. We work closely with uh, the teachers to try to um, tailor these programs even more to the students because we really want um, the program to fit the needs of the individual class and the co-learners. Um, all, all workshops are two sessions. Um, and the idea is that there's some sort of project that can come out of them. So we run the first session and we end the first session by brainstorming a project that the students are excited about. Um, so this ranges from a class project. Um, I had a class last week that has organized Waste Free Wednesdays for their entire school, which is amazing. Um, or it can be individual, just depending on your class. So I've also had students who are writing graphic novels about species going extinct. Um, or making posters or paintings about climate change. Um, so we brainstorm that at the end of the first session. And then about three weeks later, um, I come back and the students have the opportunity to share what they've worked on with me, um, as well as do a little bit of brainstorming about ways that we can make these projects and these changes um, last into the future and stay connected going forward. Um, so you can find out and register about these programs on our website, which hopefully Kirsten has dropped the link in the chat. Um, once you register for a program, you'll be connected with me and we can have an email correspondence to try to really fit the workshops to the needs of the students. Um, really, it's all about helping them to feel empowered and helping them connect to place and nature. Um, so with that, I will pass it on to Alyssa who is going to tell us about her Roots and Seeds program. Awesome, thank you, Asher. Um, let me just take a moment to share my screen. Um, I'm so happy to be with all of you today and to share a little bit about um, a program that um, was designed last summer. Um, so to provide a little bit of background, um, I was brought on uh, to work with the Sierra Club uh, as an artist in residence in 2020. Um, and I was connected to the organization through the International Center of Art for Social Change. Um, and really um, what I was trying to do amidst the pandemic um, was to find a way to engage learners um, across BC um, through arts-based approaches to environmental learning. So what you're gonna learn about um, for the next little bit um, is a creative writing and storytelling program um, and the resources that got um, created while I was making this program. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through them so that you know how to use them in your classrooms. Um, or if you are homeschooling, then how to use them at home. Um, or even if you just want to explore them yourself, you're also welcome to do that. So um, just to kind of break down the program, um, it's designed in alignment with um, the BC school curriculum. Um, and it's targeted at learners between the ages of 11 to 15. Um, but that being said, um, with minor adjustments, you could teach the program to students that are slightly older or slightly younger. Um, it's designed to be roughly six to seven sessions long. Um, I say six to seven because there's six solid sessions and the, se the seventh one can be, um, can culminate in a presentation. Um, and they're roughly 80 minutes long. Um, again, this isn't a strict rule. Um, if you wanted to just pull apart one of the lessons from the program um, or run them at a different pace, that's totally up to you and the learners that you're working with. Um, and there's roughly 30 to 60 minutes of uh, writing assignments in between sessions. Um, the main learning objectives of the program are um, oral storytelling. Um, journaling and, and gardening, so students learn how to plant native species and um, replant items from their compost bin. Uh, they learn interview skills and story gathering skills. Um, they learn how to write creative nonfiction, climate fiction, plant-based poetry, which is poetry about plants. <laughs> um, and it can end with different presentation skills, either through publica publication or through um, oral presentations. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of the different sessions, um, I'm not going to walk you through all of the resources. Um, you're welcome to look those up after the session um, on the website, but just to give you a sense. So the first session really intros participants to storytelling and helps them to create a collective agreement on how they'd like to learn uh, together 
and um, reminds them of the lands that they're standing on and um, aims to connect them to um, the stories that they're interacting with every day um, in the environments, the local parks, the homes that they live in, um, et cetera. Um, session number two, which I'm actually gonna go into a little bit more depth in later, um, gives uh, learners tools for story gathering. So a huge component, component of this program um, was to engage learners with intergenerational um, audiences. Um, and so trying to get um, children and youth to interact more with older adults, seniors and elders that they um, are already acquainted with, but maybe don't know the stories of. Um, and so that was session two. Um, then the learners move into um, learning how to develop those oral, oral stories that they've learned from older adults in their lives and turning those into pieces of creative nonfiction. Um, they move into editing those stories and then are intro into writing flash climate fiction based on different vegetation regions uh, in and around uh, British Columbia. Um, session five teaches them how to edit those again, um, and then how to write plant poetry. So about particular plants that they might have some sort of emotional connection to already. Um, and lastly, um, the final session focuses on editing those and then writing author bios um, to kind of help them develop more ownership over their work and to prepare them to either um, create a publication together or to present these together with uh, their communities. Um, so I said that I was gonna go into a little bit more depth into one of the sessions, um, but this will just give you a bit of an idea of what um, a session looks like. And I'll run through it relatively quickly, but so this one is all focused on um, developing connections with older adults um, and learning how to gather stories and, and to learn from uh, the older adults around us. So every session starts with a check-in and with a quote of the day. The quote of the day um, really tries to help frame um, the learning of the day and to get learners thinking about um, the topics that are going to come up. So this one being about story gathering uh, has a quote from Sarah Kay um, that it's equally important to listen as it is to speak. Um, every session also comes with different check-in questions uh, to help um, educators and facilitators of learning um, to assess and understand where their learners are at as they're entering the session. There is a very fun and interactive activity in every session. Um, as this program was developed during the pandemic, I really wanted participants to be able to move around during this program and not just be sitting in front of screens and, and listening to me talk. Um, so there's several activities and there's instructions on how to run these activities with your groups of learners um, within the resources. Um, and it always fits within the, the theme of the day. Um, as this is a writing program, there's also plenty of prompts and writing tips throughout it. Um, so in this particular case, um, learners would be um, doing a, a relatively simple exercise on getting them to think about um, an activity that they've done at a park. Again, because it's really focused on experiential learning, um, a lot of the activities that follow help students to um, think about different ways of telling stories. So in this case, how we can tell stories with our bodies and not just with our words. Um, Throughout the program, you'll also notice that um, there are a lot of really meaningful connections to um, different philosophies of learning within Indigenous um, communities. And so um, there's lots of resources in there as well to help you make those connections um, with your learners. Um, in this case, highlighting the importance of oral storytelling. Um, again, some more tips and helping students to learn, yeah, open ended how to ask open-ended questions and active listening. So all these different resources would help prepare them for um, ultimately talking to um, an older adult throughout the week. So uh, moving along, I wanted to highlight a couple pieces that came out of the program just to give you a sense of things that different students wrote. 
Um, so here, um, the, the two different pieces that I'm going to read uh, came out of the pilot version of the program. Um, so here we have uh, little Amaya and she interviewed her grandma and learned lots about gardening. So her piece is called In the Garden um, and I'm going to read it for you. My grandma loves to walk in her garden. She has roses, pansies and more. Her favorite flower is the rose. She has loved them since she was a little girl. She loves them for their beauty, different colors and shapes. Their scent is so magical, it calms her down right away. The roses feed bees and butterflies with their pollen and nectar. They can also feed us with their leaves, buds and hips. You can even make rose hip tea, which is very high in vitamin C. She says roses seem so delicate yet so fierce. The thorns can really hurt. It is a wonderful plant to have. She's very fascinated by her pansies too. It may sound funny, but she's fascinated by the strength of the pansies. They look so fragile, yet they can survive through the winter, sometimes blossoming under the snow. How can they do that? To grow in such cold weather? And as soon as the sun melts the snow, they smile up at you like a dog waiting for you to throw them a ball. So just a, a nice little example of something, a unique connection that Amaya had with her grandma. Um, she learned lots about her, gar her grandma's gardening practices that she didn't know before, and it also gave her a stronger sense of how to interact with her own garden. Um, here, students were encouraged to um, observe a particular plant um, and to write a poem about it. So uh, one of the students, Victor Gubin Lee, uh, photographed that lovely uh, flower from his front garden and then wrote a, a short poem about it. So it's called Blue Star. Blue star, a beautiful blue star, like a happy shooting star, making me feel comfortable, taking me to the blue horizon where everything is more vivid. I wonder what is beyond the blue horizon. So a lovely, simple response to um, something that he sees every day. So to kind of end off my little, um, my part of this webinar with you, I wanted to do a quick, uh, brainstorming activity. This activity is actually not in the resources, um, but I wanted to do it today because it's a, a good jumping, uh, a good place to jumpstart a piece of writing. Um, so if you have a paper um, or something to write on in front of you, you can grab that um, and you're welcome to grab coloring pencils or pen or pencils as well. Um, and for this activity, I would love for you to think of a plant that you have a really strong connection to um, or a strong memory or emotional so association with. Um, so for me personally, um, uh, a plant that comes to mind um, is called an araucaria tree. I grew up in Brazil. Um, and a tree that I used to climb or that I used to do a lot of high ropes courses in was an araucaria. And I have a lot of really wonderful memories of sitting really high up in the tree and being able to um, observe the interior of Brazil, these really lush forests. Um, and so I, I could write essays and poems and stories about um, these trees that I enjoyed so much as a kid. Um, so choose a plant that means something to you um, and that you have a strong connection to. And then when you have that picture of the plant or, or the name of the plant in the middle of your page, you can put all kinds of um, word associations that you have with this plant all over the page. So you could write the color that it is, um, the shape that it is, um, words that you associate with it. Um, you could put, um, whether it's in your home, whether it's in a forest, whether it's in your backyard at a park, um, whether or not you water it, you take care of it. Um, and start to fill your page with all kinds of different ideas. To add to that, you can also add um, emotion words. So maybe the memories that you have with this plant are complex. Perhaps they, this plant makes you angry for some reason, or maybe it makes you um, feel really joyful or really sad um, or excited or surprised. Um, and you can add to your brainstorm map um, all kinds of different emotion words as well. 
And we're not going to write anything right now, but I just wanted to do this with you so that you can think about how you could do this with your different groups of learners, um, because this would be a great place to then jumpstart into writing a poem or writing a story or um, using the, the story or the image of this plant as a metaphor in an essay. Um, and I've, I personally have found it very helpful with students because they can connect with these ideas really, really easily. Um, so that's it for me. You can find the resources on the education website under the Roots and Seeds uh, heading. And oh, here I had some examples as well of different ones that came out of that brainstorm. But alas, thank you. And um, you can keep an eye out for different Roots and Seeds um, programming, programming opportunities in the future. Um, and of course, feel free to use the resources with your groups of learners. Thank you. I'll pass it back to Asher. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was beautiful. Um, I would really invite and encourage everyone to, to share in the chat um, what they thought for this, this prompt that Alyssa has, has led us through. Um, my plant was garlic and very complex feelings of home and safety and comfort and the, the smell there. Um, but I would love to, to read what everyone was thinking about. That was a wonderful activity, so thank you. Um, we have about 15 minutes um, of allotted time. So this was a time that we've just left open for question and answer. Um, so feel free to drop anything in the chat, um, anything we've talked about, anything you have more questions about. Um, yeah, we're just, we're really excited to be sharing all these educational resources with you. Um, we have a lot on our website and I would encourage you to explore as much as possible there. Um, so there's the PDF of everything Alyssa shared with Roots and Seeds. Um, so you can take bits and pieces or the whole thing. Um, and then we also have a lot of packets that Kirsten, myself and some other members of the education team put together um, that take you through different activities for a range of learners um, um, that you can either bring into your classroom with or without us, um, print off or send to um, the families of your, of your learners and students. Um, but I'm wondering if we have any questions, so feel free to drop things in the chat and we will try our best to answer. Um, so I'll just pause for a moment and let people think and write any questions or reactions they might have. If there's no questions, that's okay. I saw that there were some going through. Oh, here we go. Oh, from Sean. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, and if there are no questions and people don't want to share their plant, that's okay. Um, I know it's hard to create any sort of community on webinars. Um, ideally, we'll be in person one day and we can actually be interacting and meeting each other. Um, if no one has questions or wants to share anything else, oh, sure, that's amazing, go for it, please. I have a question for Alyssa. Um, I was really, I have looked through the PDF file, but um, I, I found your presentation to be far more explicit and I was really actually quite excited. Um, is there handouts or um, idea sheets to go for the young learners as well as a curriculum plan to help the facilitators of the learning in your, in your package? Um, I don't have any worksheets, um, but really um, the, the slides can function as slides that you would use within the classroom, either online or in person. Um, and really that all that students need are, I would say is paper and, and pen, um, and they can do most of the program um, from there. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes, that's great, thank you. Um, and Asher, I have a question for you as well. Um, so I, I hear that you are interested in the middle school um, ages, and I'm wondering if you are, thinking about moving further. Thank you, Shar. 
Um, yeah, I'm currently working with the middle school ages, but we are wanting to expand into high school programming. Um, so if any of you are working with high school age co-learners, um, definitely keep an eye out as we start to develop it, that programming. Um, we have a lot of different ideas about what that might look like. Um, something that we're feeling really excited about is also this idea of mentorship. Um, so matching up, um, I guess, adults as we might be um, with high school learners, with elementary learners and seeing how, how there can be a chain of mentorship around climate action, self-expression, um, and ultimately working towards social justice. Um, I see that Kim had a question. What are some successful climate change action projects you have seen? I love this question. Um, there have been some really amazing ones. Um, I did a few workshops in a school in Surrey recently, and um, all the, the classes that I worked with there were really excited about doing full school um, change. So they took different days of the week um, and made different themes that were led by the different classes. Um, so on Fridays, they're doing Fresh Air Fridays where they encourage everyone to walk or bike to school. Um, and they've created structures to try to encourage the, the primary students like the K to two um, to get matched up with, with buddies in their neighborhood who are at the intermediate level. Um, so that's a bit safer. Um, getting people to drive less and have these big walking and biking trains. Um, then on Wednesdays, they are doing um, waste-free Wednesdays um, where they're trying to make sure that in the whole school, there isn't any um, plastic waste or food waste. So the students are eating all their food and their food is coming wrapped in reusable containers if possible. Um, so right now that those, those days are both just once a week, but they're trying to make plans of how they can make it every day next year, starting in September. Um, I also have had a lot of students who are really excited about self-expression and art, um, which I personally love. Um, clearly this is a passion of this group, I think you can tell. Um, so I had a class where all of the students wrote climate change haikus, um, which were really wonderful. Um, and then also made um, some creative short stories, which they've been sharing with each other and with their homes. Um, so personally, I think of, of art and self-expression as being a big part of the, the action projects that can exist around climate change. Um, so I found a lot of hope and inspiration in those haikus and those short stories. Um, so those are just a few, there's, there's a whole bunch. Um, uh, my, my big message when working with students is that their action project um, can match their passion. It doesn't have to be like a whole lot of work that they don't want to do. It can be work that they actually enjoy doing. Yeah. Amazing. So if, if those are all the questions, um, thank you for spending your afternoon with us. Many haichikas to all. Um, big invitation from all of us is that you go outside this afternoon or evening if possible um, and spend some time in the trees, breathing in the fresh air um, and take a moment to relax. Um, I know that everyone here who works in education is working really hard. It's been a hard year. So take a moment for yourself, take care of yourself and do what makes you feel okay. Um, and hopefully book some workshops and look at our resources because we're really um, excited about working with you in the future. If that is everything, have an excellent evening, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. And I think we'll sign off unless Kirsten or Shar wants to add anything or Alyssa. I was just going to um, thank both uh, Alyssa and Asher um, very much for sharing a very deep passion of yourself, of your own um, personal interest, as well as your uh, great joy in helping others to learn and grow and be engaged in all the variety of ways that they could be. And a big thank you to Kirsten for um, being really um, the backup tech person along with myself and making sure that you have the answers that you need in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, and um, yes, so, 
Um, Christian has just posted an invitation. We're having um, a webinar on Tuesday coming in a couple of days in the evening time. And the advantage of signing up for this webinar is that you will also get to see a copy of the uh, recording afterwards. So that if you, just like today, if you wanted to share this recording afterwards, you could share it with your learners or your um, fellow teachers, your administration. If there's something that you wanted to book, um, I know that we are open to more than just the programs that you saw here today. We are very creative people, all of us, and um, we can think of some really cool programs that might be also exciting. So um, please don't feel stuck on just the ones that you're seeing here. Um, we could certainly have a, a more engaging conversation and develop a whole program for schools. We are, especially in this time of Miss COVID, entertaining uh, those ideas of um, potentially working with a whole school um, as opposed to just one class. Um, if that's of interest to you, please also do connect with us and you can connect with us to get a hold of Alyssa. If that's also of interest, we can pass that forward to Alyssa um, or do a contract with all of us together. So again, many thank yous, many haitsepka for your afternoon, your good ears, your good hearts and minds. And we really want to, to offer um, more ways to be able to support the um, really good work that you're doing of engaging the beautiful young minds and hearts of our future generations that are gonna come up and support us. So um, I'm passing that thank you ahead of time because sometimes in our tiredness um, and exhaustion, we might not always remember that part. So maybe somebody's ears need to hear the thank you. So thank you so much. Many, many haitika haitsepka. And just to let you all know, that we will be following up with an email to you all that includes all the all of the of links that we have posted. So if you didn't get all of them opened up or or uh, saved, we will follow up with those. Okay. So have a really great evening, everyone, and take care. And thank you for joining us.